κυρίες και κύριοι καλησπέρα σας. Σήμερα έχω τη μεγάλη χαρά να συναντώ έναν φιλέλληνα. Το φωτογράφο που ξεκινώντας από τη δεκαετία του 50 μας έχει παραδώσει τη χώρα στα χρόνια της ανθότητας πριν την έκρηξη της τεχνολογίας και του τουρισμού. Μαζί μας σήμερα είναι ο Ρόμπερτ Μακέιμπ. Mr. McCabe, it's an honor having you here with us. Thank you, Angela. Kalispera. Kalispera says. You speak a little broken Greek, yeah. I see. In a comispasmeno. The interview will take place in English. Thank you. I was thinking, the first time you set foot on Greek soil, you were a 20-year-old student of the history of art. What were your first impressions? It was so different, uh, Greece, compared to where I lived in Rye, New York, uh, that everything was uh, dramatically different. Of course, the strongest impressions were of the Aegean Sea and the mountains, because where I lived in Rye, New York, it was flat territory and the sea was a muddy gray year round. So it was a a uh, very dramatic thing to see uh, beautiful Greek uh, seas. It was uh, 1954. Was it common by then uh, for American undergraduates uh, to travel to Europe? It was quite common because there were a lot of ways to come. Uh, for example, uh, we traveled on a student ship uh, from... Uh, wow. You crossed the Atlantic by ship. By ship, yes. By ship, yes. And, uh, and I traveled for many years by ship after that, before uh, airplanes became in common use. Uh, the uh, ship was called uh, the Castel Felici, the happy <laughs> castle, and it was a very old uh, ship. And my brother had gotten a job on the ship editing the student newspaper. And as a result of his position, where he got free passage, he got me a ridiculously low fare. Uh, I understood rather quickly why the fare was so low. I was in the very bottom of the ship in a bunk bed. Wow. And uh, we, An adventure. I, an adventure, to say the least. Uh, one morning, I remember waking up and putting on my glasses and uh, looking around, and there was no one else in the room. Uh, so I climbed down and I found that I was up to my knees almost in water. And I said, my God, the ship is sinking. <laughs> so I uh, put on a few things and I ran upstairs. The but, Titanic. But when I passed the, the bathroom, I noticed there was a toilet overflowing and that was the source of the water. But it was momentary panic. But that was the student ship of that era and explain why the fair was so reasonable. Your elder brother accompanied you, or you accompanied him uh, during your first uh, uh, visits uh, to Greece. You were obviously very close. Can you describe your relationship by that time? My older brother was my, my model in life, and I really was following him. Every school he went to, I went to, uh, he got interested in photography before me. I got interested uh, as a result of him. And uh, it was very natural when he got a job on the, uh, on the ship to come to Europe uh, that I would uh, come with him because I was basically following everywhere in his uh, footsteps. It is well known the story about the baby brownie that your father gave you when you were only five years old. And I was wondering whether you asked for a camera or it was his perception of your talent that... It was his perception, uh, not of any talent I had at that moment, but it was his perception. And uh, he knew that I was interested in the... Uh, in, in the news and news gathering and his, his newspaper, the one he the published. The Daily Mirror. The da it, it was the Daily Mirror. It was the... A well-known uh, yes, newspaper. It, was, it yes. had the second largest circulation of any paper in the United States, <laughs> uh, mostly in the New York area. 
and it was a picture newspaper. It was owned by William Randolph Hearst. And uh, I, uh, of course, was interested initially in dramatic scenes. Uh, with my baby brownie, I would try to capture something that might be publishable in the Daily Mirror. And once in a while, I succeeded. For example, I was uh, on the train to New York once, and the train hit some poor man, and I got out and photographed it. I don't know, I don't remember exactly how old I was. It was, I was more than five taking the train, and the Mirror published that, and they, they published uh, a number of other photographs, including some photographs of Greece after the earthquake. Growing up, how did you choose the landscapes or the subjects of your photographs? I really was interested initially in photographing things that were dramatic and might be of interest to the editor of the Daily Mirror. But uh, then... There's a shift <laughs> <laughs> in your, I, that, 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 uh, that we see in your many books, in, impressively. Thank you. Uh, then I, I went away to a school, again following my brother in western Massachusetts. And uh, there, there was no possibility of anything dramatic happening. So I got interested in photographing landscapes and, and people doing their daily routine. Uh, I remember one series of photographs that I took there. I was fascinated by one single landscape in different times of year and in different weather. I would stand in the same place and photograph the same scene. And uh, three of them appear in uh, one of my early books. It is well known also the photograph of the three young girls uh, in Zagorohoria thing that you re-photographed uh, 50 years later. Yes, yes. Uh, th these uh, three girls, uh, Maria and uh, Eleni and uh, the third maybe will come to me in a minute, but I photographed them in a place called, uh, that was then called uh, Anno Peristeri. It was on the road from Metsova to uh, Ioannina. And uh, my brother and I stopped at an old bridge, one of the old stone bridges, and uh, were photographing it and uh, along came these uh, three very happy girls uh, with uh, safety pins holding their clothes together and carrying their shoes. Very poor. Very poor. And why, why did they ca uh, carry their shoes? It was explained to me later that they carried their shoes then to save them, uh, that they were used to going barefoot and they didn't want to wear out their shoes, so, so they carried them. Uh, Many years later, as, as you said, uh, we found the girls because uh, we had an exhibition in Zagohoria in, in Monodendri at the Rosario Center. And uh, the uh, poster that they made showed the three little girls. And they put one in the Lake Hotel. And along came a gentleman and he said, that's my wife. <laughs> and that was how we met them 50 years later. And in, my, uh, in a book that I did of photographs that was published in France, I don't believe you have it uh, here, uh, the story of uh, reconnecting with the ladies. And the third was Lambrini. Lambrini. See, I'm not totally failing in that <laughs> way. Uh, Maria, Eleni, and Lambrini. Lambrini. Uh, we, we met them and had a wonderful evening. Yeah, yeah. So you are emotionally attached to your subjects and uh, even the landscapes. You, you, you care, I mean, I mean, you care how the, it, they evolve. It, it's interesting because uh, I was not a very good reporter at the time. I didn't uh, stop and write down the names of the people that I was photographing, which would have been common practice for a journalist. Uh, but uh, years later, thanks uh, in the case of the Mykonos book to uh, Mrs. Samyotaki and, uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, to uh, the Kambanises, we identified many, many of the uh, people that I had photographed in 1954. And the same in the case of uh, Santorini, uh, with help uh, locally. We have Santorini. Ah. We were with the narratives of Margarita Purnara, yes. a well-known uh, journalist and writer. Yes, we had a, a wonderful collaboration with uh, Margarita. She's uh, one of the most talented storytellers of anyone I've uh, agree. known. I agree. Is it important, the chemistry, the good chemistry uh, between you and uh, the writer? It's essential, otherwise nothing will happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been uh, very, very lucky uh, in the case of the Mycenae book, uh, the collaborator was Athena Kakuri. Uh, she was married to Spiros Yakovides. And the book was dedicated to Spiros, to Spiros. who uh, succeeded uh, George Milonas at Mycenae in the excavations, who in turn, going back, uh, succeeded uh, Henrik Schliemann um, in the excavations under the auspices of the Archaeological Society of Athens. Also, one of your most distinguished books is the one about Strophades which is also awarded by the Academy of Athens. The narratives are written by Katerina Liberopoulou, a well-known, established journalist, Greek journalist and writer. And I was captured by your photographs because it's like they depict the historical significance of the building. Some of them is as if the building itself is crying out to us for help. They lean somehow. We had a wonderful uh, collaboration uh, with Katerina. Uh, I had met her once when she was on an assignment, and then we met at a Christmas party, hmm. and she introduced me to her husband, uh, whose name was Dionisi. I asked him if he was from Zakynthos, and when he said yes, I said, Katerina, would you like to do a book together about Father Gregory and uh, the monastery in the Strophades, and she agreed immediately. Clavi, Gregory Clavi, the monk that exactly. stood exactly. by and, uh, the building and the <clears throat> island. I had first met uh, Father Gregory maybe uh, 20 years ago, and uh, the Reader's Digest in the United States, a magazine used to publish a series, The Most Unforgettable Character that I've ever met. And Father Gregory was in that category to think here he was single-handedly taking care of this huge monastery, which once had had 50, 60 or more uh, monks. And he was- Of the 13th century. Exactly. And he- A monument. He was, uh, he was tending it with, uh, with great love and was always worried about an earthquake uh, damaging it severely. So uh, we were very proud in this most recent edition to have uh, an introduction by the patriarch who had once himself visited the Strophades. And uh, the new edition is... The new in, edition, yes, includes... Yes, and is in color. Yes. In collaboration with the Museotech platform, you created an educational, a crucial educational program, and you are starting to tour the program. Yes, uh, the, uh, there is a wonderful uh, firm here in Athens called Peripatos, 
that, that does curriculum planning. And uh, Katerina and I worked with them on the text and the photographs that go with it, and they produced uh, a wonderful course that's uh, being introduced now through Museotech. This program is crucial for anyone involved in photography, <coughs> architecture, environment. The, the Museotech uh, program uh, distributes uh, to schools uh, live uh, programming and uh, it covers a wide variety of subjects. The reason why uh, they were interested in Strophadas, I think, is that this tiny island, only a mile long, has so many secrets and so many uh, lessons in terms of uh, the fact that it's a very important migratory bird stop, that it has water, although it's so tiny, it's a microcosm, really, of uh, the world and therefore is a good basis for teaching. And the children can involve during the process. Exactly, exactly. Except for uh, Strofades, uh, Sandorini, Mikines, uh, uh, there is also Mykonos, Casas, Casos, the latter of which is based on uh, your last book. Yes. How did you pick the islands? Well, in the case of uh, Mykonos and Santorini, it was uh, the fact that I had a lot of uh, material. I visited Santorini in uh, 1954 first uh, as uh, the guest of uh, inhabitant of the island, the native of the island, and we had access to the only car on the island and were able to travel and uh, see a lot. So I, I photographed a lot and I had always been interested in geology. So Santorini had a particular fascination. And uh, I took a lot of photographs. In the case of uh, Mykonos, it was a little bit uh, different because the National Geographic Society in uh, 1957 had asked me to photograph the island. So I had uh, a, the opportunity to uh, take many, many uh, photographs then. And uh, it was a sequel to the first visit I made in 1955 when I photographed in black and white. How has the time changed then? Uh, those two islands uh, you mentioned have uh, changed more dramatically than any place that I've seen on planet Earth. And you have traveled a lot. Yes. Santorini, of course, two years after my first visit, uh, was devastated in an earthquake. 85% of the houses were destroyed or badly damaged. So and we have a Santorini before the earthquake. Exactly. The, the, all of the photographs, except for a few on the volcano, were taken uh, before the earthquake. So the, the earthquake uh, did such damage to the structures that uh, rebuilding developed in uh, different styles of architecture. There was uh, no, uh, very not a very strong effort to maintain the traditional architecture. And of course, the island today is un unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. And yeah. uh, I know some natives of the island who don't go there anymore because they say they in the summer they can't walk in the, the streets of the, the villages. In, During the sunset yeah, in Nia. In the case of uh, Mykonos, of course, uh, the beautiful landscape uh, has now uh, been altered very significantly with the building of houses. Fortunately, Hora remains quite similar, although it's turned from the residential area that it was when I first visited there to a giant outdoor, indoor shopping center. There's no need to ask when did these islands appeal to you more than or now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think the, the answer is clear. There, there was an authenticity about them and their way of life uh, that was very, very appealing. Uh, it seems clear now with hindsight that uh, in the way of life that I saw really hadn't changed much in two or three thousand years. There was no uh, electricity or scant electricity, 
no running water, no telephone, no television, no motor vehicles, just donkeys and uh, uh, mules. And, uh, and they had the same difficulty of connecting with either the mainland or other islands that they did a thousand years ago. Uh, and it was before the era of roll-on, roll-off uh, ferry boats, and uh, every uh, vessel that came was unloaded uh, with a crane or uh, by a tender into, uh, and that went for passengers as well as cargo. So it was a painstaking uh, process. The same goes, I suppose, uh, even for Patmos. Patmos is on the edge. It uh, has uh, changed, uh, but the changes are not yet as dramatic. Patmos, fortunately, is protected, uh, as a very few other islands are, by a, a law that uh, restricts uh, alterations to, that affect the a traditional landscape of the island. And there's a, there are a group of uh, local people there who feel very strongly about this. And of course, on the other side, there are people who want to develop the island. But fortunately, uh, the law is under the jurisdiction of the Greek Archaeological Service. And uh, it's the hope of uh, all of us who uh, love the island, that uh, it will continue to be protected in the future. One of the reasons we selected the island was that we didn't see a way for there to be an airport <laughs> <laughs> because we recognize that the airports can lead to very dramatic uh, change. You're so right. also traveled to Antarctica, China, Cuba. How do you pick the places? Well, the really differences between the two. In the case of Antarctica, the Daily Mirror was asked to send a reporter to cover deep freeze, which is the Navy's program for studying the Antarctic and maintaining bases there and no one wanted to go. So <laughs> I heard that no one wanted to go, so I volunteered. And uh, I was uh, very pleased uh, with the opportunity to visit the South Pole. Although we didn't land there, we went on a, a large cargo plane and uh, dropped supplies to the uh, base uh, at the South Pole. But it was a wonderful opportunity and we saw quite a bit of the continent, seeing that we were only there for a week. It was a great thrill. In the case of, of, course, uh, of course. China... We envy you <laughs> deeply, Mr. McCabe. It is said that human beings are all of the same. Having traveled so much and so far, and that far, do you agree with that saying? Pretty much, although uh, I noticed that in... In China and in Cuba, there were some people who really didn't want to be photographed. Most people uh, did. And of course, when I first came to Greece, everyone, particularly in the islands, loved to be photographed because cameras were so rare. But the, the trip to China came about because I had a uh, friend who had uh, actually had been born in China and uh, he uh, invited us to come with him and we had a, a wonderful uh, trip there and 
took a lot of uh, photographs of, again, things that one won't see much of anymore. Old Shanghai represented a tremendous opportunity to photograph something that uh, was actually being demolished every day that we went there to photograph it. In the case of Cuba, it was not a consciously planned trip. Uh, we were with a friend on his uh, boat, which had an English flag, and uh, he said, shall we go to Cuba? And I said, hey, I can't go to Cuba. I am an American citizen. <laughs> and they looked up what the law was, and the law was not that you couldn't go to Cuba, but you couldn't spend money in Cuba. And since we were on a, on a private boat, uh, we had no issue about uh, spending money. So that was <laughs> how those three trips originated, uh, Antarctica, Cuba, and China. Reading your books and uh, watching your photographs, somehow it occurred to me to ask you whether the faces are landscapes somehow, metaphorically, poetically. That's a, that's a very, very interesting question and, and not an easy one to answer. Uh, I'm working on a book and hopefully an exhibition of uh, portraits that I've taken starting in 1954 up to the present. And uh, when I look at some of the pictures, I can't quite remember where they're from. And I look into the faces to see, is there a hint of where these pictures were uh, taken? Uh, and in a way, it suggests that perhaps there are ways of looking at uh, the faces and uh, determining more, but I, have been using Instagram as a, as a crutch, really, to find uh, the sources of some of the photographs which I haven't been able to identify. And I have uh, uh, friends I've made on Instagram who've identified places where my memory have failed and even developed the names of people in these places. Are there certain characteristics that help you, that uh, through them you dive deeper? I think that uh, it's a question of an interesting... Certain features, the eyes a, maybe, or, or, the, or the hands. It's an interesting subject, yes. and uh, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I took some photographs in Casos this summer at the Panigiri. I had photographed it before in 1965. And uh, I noticed and got interested in what the people were wearing so many years later, mm. from 1965, 57 years later. And I also noticed and photographed the way people were sitting, uh, the, the body language that came out of uh, the way people were seated. So I took a lot of photographs, probably many more photographs since it was uh, digital uh, than analog than I had <laughs> when I was there in 65. Yes, you were an analog photographer. And that yes. was a question I've been meaning to ask you. How do you feel uh, and how do you work in this digital era? It was a tough transition in a way because the Roloflex uh, was such a wonderful camera that to uh, move to a different technology, I felt almost like abandoning family or something uh, <laughs> like that. Attached uh, deeply. And uh, when I first started experimenting with digital, I, I definitely experimented too early because the cameras 
uh, were had very very low resolution, and uh, I have a whole series of photographs uh, that I took in that transitional period that I like very much, but they're unusable because they have uh, so few uh, pixels in the capture. I keep tall, calling George and Sophie Marinos in my laboratory <laughs> and ask, is there any new software that can sharpen these? But I don't think we're there yet. Most of your material, obviously, is in black and white. There are many photographers, uh, some of them very famous, uh, who believe, colleagues of yours, who believe strongly that black and white photographs allows us to go deeper, delve deeper into a subject because the color captures somehow all, all of our attention and disorients us somehow. There, there's a, a lot of uh, truth to that, uh, but there is another side. And I really learned the hard way uh, when I ha had been uh, given all of this Kodachrome film by the National Geographic Society and told to go and photograph in the Cyclades, I had only taken maybe 30 pictures in color before that. And I quickly discovered that composition is entirely different in the two media. You can have uh, color which is very, very distracting too many colors, too many things going on. Uh, so color really, I believe, has to, color photography has to simplify the subject and the composition to make it more coherent, more harmonious. Because if there's just a riot of colors, I don't think you get the same uh, effect and strength that you can get in black and white where you're composing in shades of gray and, and black. And I think the same goes for smiling faces. There are photographers who believe strongly that smiles are overwhelming. Somehow they cover everything. This is a very, very interesting question, a very interesting subject. I've discussed it uh, on a couple of occasions with uh, Costa Manos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that uh, they, they're really two different ways of uh, photographing a person. One which I grew up with was kind of a candid uh, photography where you captured people in their activity, not looking at a lens. But uh, as I have uh, gotten older and probably not wiser, I believe that a lot of interesting photography uh, of people can be done by the person looking directly into the camera, maybe smiling, maybe not smiling. But that is a communication with the viewer of the photograph, whereas a candid scene doesn't have that element of communication of the individual person communicating directly with the viewer of the photograph. Also, I was thinking about Dibuan Metz, who believed that uh, photography is thanatography. They compared photographs to death because of the silence and the stillness. Well, I, th I think that... Uh, that characterize <laughs> the photographs. I, I think a, a still photograph uh, captures a moment and you can you can call it a death but both black and white and color photographs can have an enormous amount of life in them for example the photograph that i took aboard the despina of a group of young people uh, singing and playing an accordion in deck class i think has a huge amount of life i i think uh, Calling it thanatography would be uh, very much of a misnomer of that. So I think uh, color photography too can capture a lot of life. Photographs of uh, dancing may not uh, have the characteristics of a movie, but they definitely can show motion and can evoke the response of 
a lively scene in the viewer's eyes. is the strongest memory you have of Greece during the 50s or until now, is you it? You know, there, there, <laughs> there's so, so, many so many strong memories, it's are hard to any, say. Are there any stories you'd like to share? But, uh, we would like to hear some stories. Uh, I, how many hours do you have? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think to answer the first question, one of the very uh, strong memories in contrast to today was when I arrived in Athens, and you're too young to remember this, there were no traffic lights in the city, entire city, yet there were trucks and buses and, and a few private cars. Uh, occasionally there would be a policeman at a strategic corner, for example, uh, at the intersection of uh, Vasilis Sophias Amalias and Panepistimia, there was a traffic policeman in front of the GB who <laughs> directed traffic. And I think every Christmas or Easter he was uh, given a lot of gifts. But that was a rarity. So crossing a street was an adventure. <laughs> You'd have to gang up with other pedestrians and try to push your way out into the traffic to, until some poor driver uh, got scared that he might kill more than one person. And, and would stop, and then you crossed. So that's an enormous contrast with today's pedestrian lights and uh, pedestrian lanes. Uh, that was uh, total uh, mayhem at the time and disorganization. Uh, but uh, I have many uh, wonderful, interesting memories from travels in uh, Greece. Uh, one that uh, is among the most startling was, uh, and this was quite late, this was in 1971. My wife and I were uh, traveling. Your Greek wife. Exactly. I don't know whether she, she was brought up in Greece or? She was brought up in Greece. Uh, she, Constantina. Constantina, who decided to get an education first in France and then in the United States. Where you met. Where we met. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, we stopped. I used to travel, or we used to travel, with literally a suitcase full of guidebooks to Greece and the Greek islands. Uh, because you, there was a limitation of the knowledge that was available in many islands. So you'd search through these books. We arrived on one island. And the only reference we could find was in Theodore Bent's book, Life Among the Insular Greeks, which was published in 1888. So the freshest knowledge we had was 1888. Anyway, the mayor of the island's name <laughs> was mentioned. So we just walked into town uh, and we asked for this name. And they said, oh, the mayor? <laughs> so it turned out that the same family was still uh, running the village. And he also happened to be the doctor. Nepotism. And <laughs> he invited us uh, to have uh, dinner at his house. And we had a delightful dinner. At one point, the conversation 
got a little slow. So I said, does anyone here sell old Greek musical instruments? I said, I, I love the, the sound and also the appearance uh, of these old musical instruments. And uh, he said, well, I have a Stradivarius violin I'd like to sell. How is this Greek? <laughs> <laughs> this red and we, we almost <laughs> fell out of our chairs, uh, and we said, "Well, could we could we see it?" And he said, "Well, I keep it down at the harbor because I'm hoping maybe an English yacht will come along and and buy it." And uh, we went uh, down with him the next morning. Uh, you walk through a chicken coop and upstairs to a room and. <laughs> I, I photographed it carefully. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out to be a reproduction a of, fake. of a Stradivarius. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to put it politely, but it was a fake. It was a fake. <laughs> Many of your books are theme-based, and I was wondering when the categorization happens, before the shooting or after. Yeah. I was thinking the wooden boats of the Aegean, for instance, which is a theme-based book. It was uh, entirely after the fact. Uh, we had an exhibition at Citron Gallery with the proceeds going to the uh, traditional boat society of Greece. Uh, they're trying to protect Kaikis from being demolished by under EU orders, which is a very worthy cause, I think, to keep the shipyards in the islands uh, going, keep employment and keep these beautiful wooden boats in the Aegean. But that book was put together from old uh, photographs. I think uh, the Strophatis book is more based on uh, a, a theme knowing we a were theme. going to. And uh, Mycenae as well. I had been asked The categorization, by the organization happens afterwards? The, no, the, the Mycenae uh, I was asked by the archaeologist in charge at the time, Alan Wace, to come there in 1955 and photograph. So uh, I took uh, hundreds of photographs of the site. We didn't know at that time how they would be used, uh, but uh, they were a record for the service and then when uh, Mrs. Kakuri and I uh, discussed it, we decided it would make an interesting book, and she wrote a, a wonderful uh, text for the book, recreating uh, very accurately our first uh, visit to Mycenae in 1954. I love your books <laughs> and your photographs, really. These days you are honorary citizen of Greece, and uh, since the 19s, you owe a house in Athens, Plaka. How did Plaka change through the years? Plaka has gone through uh, dramatic changes. Of course, it used to be uh, the entire village of Athens in the early 19th uh, century. Uh, when we first came here, it was still an important residential area, but then it began to develop uh, bad habits of uh, bars and uh, even drugs. And uh, when we bought the house, it was at a, a, a low point, but there were promising things going on uh, in, as a result of work by Eleniki Ataria and the mayor of Athens at the time. And uh, it became then uh, less of the bars and uh, drug uh, dealing uh, and became a, a residential area again uh, with uh, some wonderful tavernas. Uh, but uh, today it's changing again. Our bakery, which used to be at one number 128 Adrianu Street uh, has vanished, and our wonderful butcher uh, has vanished, and tourist shops 
now have uh, taken over. They're, they've grown over the years, uh, tourist shops, which is fine, but now they really have overwhelmed the uh, local services. The, the other thing about uh, Plaka is that there are uh, too many uh, abandoned houses. Uh, many of them are owned by the government. Uh, others are owned by uh, individuals who have uh, left Greece. Some are owned by foundations, which took them under terms that they could never sell them. So, but they're not occupied, they're abandoned. And I'd, I'd like very much to see a program of uh, looking at each of the old houses, many of them very uh, beautiful, that are abandoned or in, uh, somewhat in ruins. Amazing, amazing. Seeing how they can be uh, restored and uh, put to work because there is, it is a wonderful, wonderful neighborhood to live in. referred to as Philelin. Are you at ease with this Byronesque term? What brings you close and what distances you from Lord Byron, who is the Philelin as we can picture? It's, it's interesting one. That, uh, that, as you mentioned, now that I'm a Greek citizen, that you would still ask that. I thought that that question might stop when I became a Greek citizen. <laughs> uh, but, I, but you became a Greek citizen because you love Greece. Right. And uh, uh, I had a professor at Princeton by the name of uh, Edmund Keeley, Mike Keeley, whose dad was in the diplomatic corps in Greece, who was a, a true uh, Phil Helene and who translated the poetry of Kavafi and Seferis and others. He unfortunately left us uh, recently, but he was a wonderful friend. and. We used to joke about whether there was any cure for Philhellenism. <laughs> and we decided possibly there was only one cure, and that was owning real estate in Greece. <laughs> But it didn't always work, and it didn't work in either of our cases. You mentioned uh, Lord Byron. Uh, it uh, so happened that uh, I wrote my thesis at uh, Princeton on Lord Byron and Greece and his role in the uh, Greek Revolution. And uh, many years later, uh, my wife gave me as a Christmas present Lord Byron's first passport uh, on his first visit to Greece in 18. Ten. It was a fairman, of course, in uh, uh, Old Turkish, uh, Turkish written in Arabic script, very difficult to read, but we did have it read, and it was uh, his passport, uh, his fairman from his first visit to Greece, which What? I'm very proud to own. <laughs> Quite a precious possession. Going through your books, In chronological order, what would you say has been the driving force of your art? I think uh, communication. The, the first book I did was uh, in conjunction with Bruce Lansdale, another Phil Helene, who was the director of the American Farm School in Salonika. Uh, Bruce and I met one day and uh, in 15 minutes we agreed that we would do a book together and the book um, which is, uh, is still sold in uh, the used book uh, markets uh, was uh, called Metamorphosis or Why Do I Love Greece and it was a combination of his poem about Greece and why he loved Greece and my photographs. So that was a very definitely a thematic uh, book. Uh, unfortunately, it was not uh, uh, printed 
very well and the photographs didn't show very well. Uh, it was before we discovered the magic of uh, tritone printing. The Most all of my books uh, since then have been printed by Trifolio in Trifolio, Verona. Trifolio, yes, I've noticed. A man by the name of Massimo Tonoli, whom I think is the uh, greatest artist in the printing of color and black and white photographs. Amazing. Earth. The printings and the, your photographs. The first book we did with, uh, with Massimo at Trifolio, uh, when it arrived in Greece, people were uh, looking at the book and they were all complimenting the printing and not the <laughs> photography. <laughs> I felt left out of the process, but the printing was so, so much better than what uh, they were used to seeing in Athens. It, it was dramatic. Last question, Mr. McCabe. How different you are from this 20-year-old student who came to Greece? almost 70 years ago? Well, I, I don't want to misuse a line from uh, Zorba, but uh, I remember that line that he says, the full catastrophe, wife, children, house. <laughs> And of course, in my case, it hasn't been a catastrophe, but it was a most wonderful experience uh, meeting Dina and getting married and having uh, two children. How did these experiences change you, marked you? How are you different? That's really a, a tough <laughs> question and probably best, uh, probably would be best to ask my, my brother that. But uh, I'm really happy that uh, Uh, my old photographs are appreciated here and that they do tell a story, that they have recorded history. I think the most wonderful thing about photography is that it documents the scene, but also with luck you can add some aesthetic value and some something that makes it more interesting. Uh, Costa Manos has always said that Uh, what makes a photograph stand out is the surprise element in a photograph. And another great photographer, French photographer, Brassai, used to say it's the force of an image that counts. So here I am, and it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak with you and talk a little bit about uh, photography after all these uh, years of coming to Greece. And, and photographing the changes here. The honor is, uh, and the happiness is all mine. Thank you so very much, Mr. McCabe. Thank you. Και ευχαριστούμε και εσάς, κυρίες και κύριοι, θερμά που παρακολουθήσατε αυτή την εκπομπή. Καλό σας βράδυ.